my interest in Southeast Asia goes back a long, long way, back to when I was in the Navy many, many years ago. And uh, my first extensive period of time in Indonesia was in 97, 98, when I was there on a student Fulbright. And that was the year that the Suharto dictatorship fell. So it was a very interesting time to be there. And it ushered in a period of uh, reformation, or reformasi as the Indonesians call it. Um, I've been watching their elections ever since then, not in an official capacity, but just going and gathering stories from people in the context of the election campaigns and the elections themselves. And we've formalized this into a research program that we'll be telling you about, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the support of the Center for Global Studies, which has been very generous, and the American Institute for Indonesian Studies at Cornell, which has also contributed to funding our research. Um, it is an interesting topic, looking at some of the transitional societies in Southeast Asia, the Philippines transitioning from dictatorship to a democracy, the, 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 Thai society, the, the Thailand government transitioning from a long period of intermittent quasi-authoritarian to military governments, finally launching into the democracy area in the 1990s with setbacks, of course. Um, and there's a lot of popular support for the setbacks in some cases. And we're very interested in what makes people think that maybe democracy is going too fast, what makes people think that democracy is not going fast enough. What do people want from it? What do people expect from democracy? Um, and that's what we're really about here. Let's see if I can do this without screwing up. Yes, okay. A lot of the research on democratic transitions, uh, very good research, focuses on institutions, and it focuses on the procedural aspects. People send legions of uh, election observers to make sure procedures are followed. People have access to the vote. People have access to the franchise. Two presumptions embodied in this, though. One is that the presumption that the people want democracy and the government is somehow keeping it from them. And it's very questionable in some of these cases. And the other is that democracy is necessarily going to follow the Western, or at least the dominant pattern that characterizes the Western world in terms of democratic societies. Um, we find that really questionable, and one of the things that we thought we'd like to do is go and ask. Many of the critiques that are out there that have been produced in the last few years talk about the Indonesian democracy in terms of low-quality democracy, authoritarian democracy, incomplete democracy, deficient democracy, defective democracy. These are all terms that have been used by political scientists talking about the transition. And they all seem to reflect this assumption that there is one path without thinking that the democracy we know in the West was shaped by the experience and the cataclysms of centuries of Western experience Maybe people with a very different experience have a very different idea of what they expect from their government and what they expect from democracy. Um, click again. One of the, these are two of the main questions we're trying to examine here. How do people develop the ethos, the attitudes and the expectations required for effective participation in democracy? How do people learn democracy? We used, to say, we used to ask how do people teach democracy, and we're still researching that. But what's, what we've found in, in our research is very interesting is how do people learn it, and what shapes that process? And in the process of this research, we've gathered a lot of stories over the years. And I turn it over to you. Thanks. So I'd like to do something a little different and tell you about some of our main findings through a series of stories, sort of a narrative, things we've found. Okay, imagine it's 3 a.m., central Java, and uh, a man is pacing around his living room. And he's very nervous. He's expecting a visitor. It's, he should have been here a couple hours ago. Where is he? Is he going to come? Did he forget? He's very, very anxious. It is the morning of election. This is election day. The man has stayed up all night waiting for this visitor. Finally, his anxiety is broken with a knock at the door. And he answers the door. They engage in small talk. And he's handed an envelope by the man, by the visitor. Inside the envelope are a couple of things like this, advertisements for the candidates. Has a candidate's picture, their uh, place on the ballot, this is number three, so voters know even if they forget the name, it's got their name. And it's got a little slogan right here that they think is a pretty good slogan. No corruption, no lies. That's what they think is going to resonate with the voters. No corruption, no lies. Also inside the envelope is cash money. So much for no corruption. So 
this is a process or this is a, a practice known as money politics, vote buying. They sometimes call it uh, coffee money because it's supposed to be a small amount for coffee. But basically the idea is that in some parts of Indonesia, candidates give money to candidates in exchange for their votes. So that's the first story. The people, the, the visitor who gave the money to the voter, he's known as a broker, like a financial broker. He inter he's an intermediary between the candidate and the voters. So let's go to the broker's house. He's sitting in his living room as well. He has a visitor. This broker, a month before the election, committed to supporting a candidate. He would give money. He would you know, so, uh, speak well of the candidate in his communities. And the broker's visitor is the opposing candidate. He's there to try to convince the broker to betray his, to defect from his uh, candidate and support the other one. He offers them some things. The first thing he offers is money. I'll give you more money than the other candidates paying you to be my broker. The broker says, no, no, I have a business. I don't need the money. I don't do this for the money. Second offer comes. The candidate says, well, I know this person who can provide goods to your business. He can provide supplies to your business at a cheaper rate than you're getting now. Let me help you with that. The broker says, no, no, thank you, though. The final offer, the best offer, comes, and keep in mind the candidate is from a very prominent family, a very well-known family. They trace their roots back to Javanese royalty. So very famous, prominent, well-known family. The candidate tells the broker, if you'll come work for me, my daughter will marry your son. They're about 15 years old at the time. So this is a serious deal. Why? would they offer this much? And why would the broker refuse? And our colleague in Indonesia actually asked this broker, why did you refuse? You got a much better offer from this candidate than that candidate. And the answer was telling. He said, I have committed to this candidate in front of the people. How can I face the people if I betray him? And what he meant by that is that he owns a business. He's a community leader. And if he betrays the candidate that he supported, he went out and talked to his workers about supporting the candidate. He talked to his neighbors about supporting the candidate. If he betrayed them and supported the other candidate, what would the people think of him? And the implication of this is that this activity, viewed by the West as transactional, candidate gives money, the people vote for the candidate because of the money, this undermines it. it this behavior happens in a social context. So third story. Little village in central Java, a couple of miles down the road. A incumbent is running for re-election. This will be his last campaign. He's going to go back, run his business, you know, go about becoming a regular citizen. He's not running. If he gets re-elected, it's his last term. He is a very popular incumbent. He's so popular with the public in, this, in his village, by the way, that nobody else runs against him. He's running completely unopposed. His name is the only one on the ballot. And as long as he shows up and votes for himself, he'll win. Now. Even though this candidate has, you know, is guaranteed to win, he still, on election day, goes around and gives money to the voters, which makes no sense. Because if this Western perspective that this is purely transactional and raw political uh, gamesmanship is correct, then this incumbent has no reason to give the money, and yet he does. And when asked about it, he simply said, the people expect the leaders to provide for them. And I think that is some of the clearest evidence that what we're talking about here is, goes deeper than simply corruption, as it's often viewed by you know, government officials there and so forth. <clears throat> it actually has a social aspect to it, and it actually has a cultural aspect to it that if you bore down deep enough, and what our research is showing, is that it has to do with conceptions of democracy. The people, at least in this area, don't view the money as simply an exchange for their vote. They view it as their leader and their government providing for them. And that, I think, and I'm going to wrap it up very quickly, that, I think, changes how we view this. Um, this simple practice of money politics illustrates that there are big differences, not just in voters, but also in the leaders, the candidates, and the elected officials, in what democracy means to them. For some people, democracy means that the government provides for the people. In, for other people, they view vote buying as corruption, as buying votes, and for them, democracy means holding the government accountable to the people. And these different conceptions 
um, we're finding are backed up by pretty good uh, survey evidence, survey data. Um, just very quickly, we, uh, we have, we already have a paper that's under review where we find that, that the attitudes, uh, citizens' attitudes towards this vote buying practice is, uh, is very complex, very nuanced, based on education income. And we're hope and we will actually in about a month and a half, two months, fund uh, through the generous support of CGS, we'll uh, administer a pilot survey in uh, Surabaya, the second largest country in, or the second largest city in the country, that's going to ask about some of these questions. The questions we're asking have never been asked or never been asked in the same survey. So I'll kick it back to Tom and... Uh, to finish up, um, we're talking to people, we're talking to candidates, we're talking to brokers, we're talking to political consultants, which is a new and growing industry in Indonesia, um, and we're talking to government officials, um, particularly from the KPU and Polenmas, uh, Kazbang Polenmas, which are organizations that the government has to try to get people to the polls and to encourage them to participate in the democratic process. And one of the questions I always ask, and I'll wrap up with this, is do the people feel that there's any sense of accountability in the elections, that their vote in any way holds elected officials responsible, and the answer is always balloon, not yet. They're trying to build that, but it's not there. And that's one of the reasons why Andrew's project in money politics is so uh, prevalent there, is because people really don't yet feel that elections have any impact on their lives. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Thank you. <laughs>